The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. My name is Chuck Aurora. I am a software support engineer for ISC.org. And uh, the talk this morning is on the joy of DNS sex, which is what they should have named it, but oh well. Um, or how I learned to stop worrying, and uh, I am getting email notifications that I don't really want to see right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here we go. There's some little... There it goes, all gone. Okay, where are we at? All right. Um, let's move on. First thing I wanted to start out is find out a little bit about um, who I'm talking to here. Um, I didn't expect such a large crowd on Friday morning. <laughs> Everybody got off work, I guess. Um, but um, just a quick show of hands, who knows anything about DNS, I mean, what it is. All right, everybody, everybody, good. Um, is anybody here familiar with ISC, the Internet Systems Consortium? Good. Um, who, can, who knows what DNSSEC is in a nutshell? Just one person, you know, just somebody holler out a, a nutshell definition. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Do we have anyone here that owns their own uh, domain? Wow. Good deal. Now, anyone here that runs their own name server? Uh, good deal. Any of these are uh, bind or some other implementation? Bind? <laughs> others? <laughs> okay. No, we ain't got nothing against the others. Um, now, who is running a, um, a, a recursive server for uh, resolving names? Okay. And who's running an authoritative server for serving? All right. In some cases, it is. And bind is the only Im implementation that will do both, which, by the way, we don't recommend. But it can be done. All right. Good crowd. About me, I am a support engineer at ISC, publishers of Bind 9, which I guess you've heard about, uh, open source DNS server. I've been there since 2013. That's not very long. But it's been a great, <laughs> it's been a great six months. I really enjoy it. This is what I want to do when I grow up, if I do ever grow up. Um, Someone who looks a lot like me has been seen at these um, uh, self-conferences before, but going under some different name, so I don't know. But anyway, there's a rumor that I'm affiliated with slackbuilds.org. And uh, yes, that makes me a man of mystery. My family is here, by the way. Hey, you were supposed to introduce me. Oh, you don't have a microphone. Okay, all right. Well, I guess he got away with that. That's my son back there on the camera, and my other son back there. <laughs> and my wife and daughter are over here. Okay. And there's Alan Hicks. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick little um, overview of what we're going to cover in this talk. And uh, by the way, I just finished, well, I didn't actually finish, but I just got done with as much as I could get done um, before walking in the door. If it wasn't for last minutes, uh, I don't think I'd get anything done. Anyway, we're going to do a quick little overview of, um, of what, uh, how a DNS system works, which I'm gathering most of you, are, this is going to be old hat for you. It's not going to be very interesting. We'll just buzz through that quickly. We're going to talk about the need for DNSSEC, and we're going to split it. I said DNSSEC in the title. There's two different 
forms uh, that it takes. There's the validation and there is the publishing, the signing. How you go about it is pretty simple in both cases, but um, we're going we're gonna to split that in half, so we'll cover each separately. Um, references, did I put references in there? I actually had help making these slides, by the way. And we'll have a summary at the end. All right. Now, first, we're going to do the quick little um, overview of how name resolution works. You're going to see here you have your user, the client, the person. We're just going to pretend they're running a web browser, which seems to be the most common use of the internet these days. And um, they're going to be using a recursive resolver over here on the far um, uh, on your left. And then the resolver is going to contact the various authoritative servers. And here we go. The user typed in www.example.com in the browser. So his, uh, the user system um, libraries, uh, which in, in a Linux system would be glibc, is going to contact the resolver in its resolve.conf file, the name server, and it's going to ask, what is the address of www.example.com? The resolver does not know. So there, there was supposed to be an arrow, and I don't see it there, but it is talking from the resolver to the root name servers up here and asks, what is the address of www.example.com? The root name server, signified by the dot up there, replies back, here is a list of all the .com name servers. OK. So then the resolver makes another request. It goes to the .com, one of the .com name servers, and it asks the same question. What is the address of www.example.com? And the .com name server says, here is a list of example.com name servers. Okay, so the resolver knows what to do. It goes to one of those name servers and asks the very same question a third time. What is the, the address of www.example.com? Well, just so happens that this name server is authoritative for example.com and uh, names underneath it so it says, here is the answer to your question. Here is the address of www.example.com, which is then passed back to the user. And all this happens in a split second, ideally. DNSSEC, Domain Name System Security Extensions. Um, I'm not going to go into a very um, detailed uh, discussion of that because, well, that would put you all to sleep and uh, besides I'd, I'd have to have looked all that stuff up and I don't, <laughs> don't keep it in memory. But basically it's all about integrity assurance for DNS data. For the publishers of DNS data, the digital signatures which clients can verify proves that the data is what it's supposed to be. It could have been modified in transit, as the slide says, or you could have a man in the middle that's uh, substituting their own data for yours. Now we're going to go into the why and the who. Well, we, we kind of discussed the why already. Uh, we want to be sure that the data is what we want. With DNSSEC, um, internet users know that it's going to be accurate. Well, that's, of course, only for a signed zone, of course. Usually, you're going to use this for a website if, if you're just your ordinary internet user. The rest of us may not be so ordinary, and we're going to do other things. But suppose you're doing banking online. 
banks, financial institutions are one of the biggest uh, adopters of DNSSEC. Um, I'm not personally aware of, of actual um, sub spoofing attacks that have happened to banks, but that would be an obvious target. Um, paying taxes or bills online is another issue. Now, um, in the United States, the .gov top-level domain has been a major driving force behind DNSSEC because they require it of all the agencies. And they make mistakes sometimes, <laughs> as we have seen. Complaints from customers when you can't talk to .gov domains, and yes, that happens all the time. <laughs> Why would someone complain about that? Good. <laughs> Good question. Yes. DNS spoofing attacks do really occur, and sometimes in varying degrees of um, malice. For example, you're going to use a hotel um, wireless connection, and it's a captive portal, and they're going to redirect you. You're going to make a, a request for a domain name, and they're going to redirect you to, through their servers, and it's not going to return the right data. Well, it's their connection, so you can't really call that malice, but at least with DNSSEC validation, you know that they have done this. The, here's just a quick little overview of, of how DNSSEC is implemented at the various uh, points in the uh, uh, resolver chain. The user down here at the bottom, in the middle, can um, be protected by their validating resolver. And that's what we're going to cover today as to how to set up that validating resolver. We're also going to touch on you can use a browser plug-in to, um, to do the verification for you. But um, that really doesn't have much to do with bind, so I'm not going to get into that in detail. Um, okay, the resolver will, now all versions of bind, mm, I'm not sure all, yes, 9.8, all supported versions of bind 9 do include the root zone key. So you don't have to do anything special, it's there, you just have to enable the validation and it will happen. Um, the publishers of DNS data, now including the root zone and the .com zone and, and whatever second level domain there is, um, they would sign their zone with a cryptographic key. Now, usually that's going to work in, uh, with a, a dual key system. Most of you who are running your own um, authoritative name servers might be familiar with that, but there is a zone signing key and a key signing key. The key signing key only signs the, the DNS key records. The zone signing key signs everything. Okay, now we're going to touch on how. How do you set up a validating resolver? And there it is, all on one slide. You can delete your named.conf that your Linux distributor gave you. You can delete it and replace it with this one line, options, DNSSEC validation, auto, and you've got to have our nice little curly brackets and our semicolons at the end. That's just the way ISC does our config files. And that's it. Restart. It's a validating resolver. It's as simple as that. Any of you could run this on your own laptop. It's just that simple. You point your clients to it. You can use your resolve.conf file if it's running on your own system. 
If it's running on your own system, this is a little known trick, but you can simply delete your resolve.conf and make sure that it's not rewritten by DHCP clients. And the uh, glibc library is going to default to asking name server 127.0.0.1. So it's going to query your named instance and it's going to uh, get uh, records from there. Oh, now Chuck, this isn't very secure, is it? Um, are we an open resolver here? Well, no, not likely. See, the defaults for um, uh, allowing recursion are sensible. So, in fact, most of the defaults of named make good sense, which is why you can get away with such a small configuration file. You're only going to allow um, recursion for localhost and local nets. These are two built-in uh, access control lists that uh, bind uses. Localhost is the queries from the machine itself. Local nets means anything, any network that you are physically connected to. So yes, you're partly open depending on what networks you're connected to. But if you control the network, then that's not a problem. You can also serve it out to other clients via DHCP, which I'm sure there's people here that do that. Show of hands, you run your DHCP daemon, okay. Any of them use ISC DHCP? A few. Any DNS mass fans? Yes. Good piece of software. All right, for th that's it for if you're just an internet user and you don't own your own domain name and you're never interested in owning a domain name, you're down here. I'm sorry. I've got nothing else of interest for you. Um, we, you can sneak out quietly or, uh, or, or just storm out. I don't care. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the rest of this is going to be for people who own their own domains or who may be interested in doing that in the future. You got a few considerations to, to check out before you uh, can actually sign your zone. First, is your top level domain signed? And I looked at uh, this the other day and I believe that something like 60% or more, somebody correct me if you know better, but um, I believe it's, it's gotten up to about 60% of all top level domains are signed. Now that includes any domain that you are likely to use for um, most uh, American use. All the generic top level domains, com, org, net, those are all signed. Uh, edu, gov, .us, the, the US country code domain is signed. And, and that's true for, um, like I say, most country codes. Some of them are lagging behind and are not signed yet. Now if in the unlikely event that your top level domain is not signed, as a temporary um, measure, ISC provides a, a service called DLV, DNSSEC Look Aside Verification, where you submit your, your uh, DS record to us at the um, URL at the bottom, dlv.isc.org, and uh, then we publish it in our in that zone. So you could, if, it, if you have example.org, we would, your record would be example.org.dlv.isc.org. That's how that works. I'm just going over that as a little historic curiosity. Nowadays, it should not be necessary. And uh, our operations people want to get rid of DLV. But, um, but we're still providing the service. The next consideration is, and, and yes, sir, go ahead. How do you check to see if your TLD is signed? How do you check to see if your TLD is signed? Well, um, I guess the first place I would look would be um, at Wikipedia. <laughs> I, seriously, I would look up your .ws uh, or whatever. Is there not an easy technical way to do it? Oh, yeah, well, sure. Look it up in the root zone. Just uh, query, um, query it at the root zone. It'll be, um, 
dig and can you give me an example of what top level domain you're talking about? Dot systems. Dot system. Okay, systems dot. You got to put the dot at the end. Mm -hmm. Systems dot. Um, and I would query for type any, so just A and Y. It's signed. Okay, it has a DS record. Okay, a signed uh, top level domain in the root zone will have one or more NS records, usually at least two and um, one, or, one or more DS records would be there. So um, you can query that from a root server. Now you have to direct the query in dig and it would be at f.root-servers.net. I mentioned f root because that's the one that ISC runs. Assuming it's not cached, you don't have to. Good point. And who looks up dot system? I, I never have. <laughs> okay. And then the next consideration is do you host your own DNS? If you don't host your own DNS uh, master server, it's not going to be easy to do this. There's not many alternatives for uh, commercial services that are hosting the, um, the sign zone and maintaining your keys for you. I don't know if I would want them doing that, frankly, because the whole point of keys is you control it. But anyway, um, if anyone knows of any services that are doing that, I'd, I'd be interested to know. I believe DYN. DYN, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet you're right. DYN.com. Uh, Okay, for domain owners, steps to signing your zone. I'm going to just quickly run over this because I got my presentation up in this screen and we're just going to run through that and then we're going to come back to that at the end. We're going we're to go into the examples. The steps to signing your zone. You generate your keys and your DS record. You configure the zone in your namedconf file. And the example that I'm going to show is using inline signing. Inline signing is a bind 9.9 .9 feature. So if you're using bind 9.8, that's our oldest supported version. You don't have this choice. Also, the auto DNSSEC maintain, I don't remember if bind 9.8 had that, but I know 9.9 .9 does. It, 9.8 was nice, but 9.9 but .9 was better. 9.10 was a big improvement too, but we've had a few issues. It's, it's coming around. By 9.10 is our most recent release. It's on a second patch level of 9.10.0. But we've got some new toys there too. Um, every new issue is <laughs> exciting to me. Then the final step is to sign your zone and test that it's verifying properly. The last step, the very last step you want to go into is to publish your DNS, DS record. That's going to vary by registrar and possibly by top level domain. Um, most registrars now are supporting DNSSEC but some Major ones don't. What can you do? Vote with your feet. You, you can find a registrar that is going to have a better interface. Most of them only have a web interface to the, uh, to the uh, uh, publish your DS record. It would be nice, and I, I, the gentleman back in the back mentioned uh, uh, DYN, and I'll bet they, uh, for enough money have a, um, an API that you can use to uh, publish your uh, and change your DS records. Now here's a question. Why do you not want to do that until you know everything is right? What would happen? Anybody know what would happen if you publish your DNS record and all your ducks are not in a row? Well, actually, it's a little worse than that. Um, 
he said you're screwed until the TTL expires. What's going to happen is a validating resolver is going to check it and see the signature. This zone should be a secure delegation. So then it's going to ask the authoritative server for the records and if the signatures don't line up with what is in the parent domain, the DS record, that's spoofing. You blew it. This is what we see with the .gov folks all the time. <laughs> it's very common. Okay, now, um, my colleague from ISC made me put this in the presentation, but like I said, validating in your browser. This is not a, a bind issue, but I'm going to touch on it because maybe you're running one of those operating systems where uh, you can't run bind. Wait a minute, what operating system is that? No? Most operating systems support bind. Even the evil Microsoft. You can run NameD on Windows. But suppose you don't want to do that. You don't want to set up your validating resolver. For whatever reason, you can set up your web browser to validate DNS with a plug-in. And here is the plug for them. They're www.dnssecvalidate-validator.cz. OK. If you can only talk to your ISP's name server or whatever, in the case of uh, DNS hijacking, yes, that's true. You, um, you have problems. And, and I hate to say it, but my own ISP at home is like that. I have problems. OK, you're going to want a, a DNSSEC-friendly registrar. And you're going to want to use DNSSEC-friendly DNS providers. Obviously, I did not put anything on this slide, kind of for a reason. Well, I don't want to be endorsing any particular service. I mean, you all understand that. But personally, one I'm aware of is gkg.net is a very good registrar for their support of uh, DNSSEC. They are also a DNSSEC friendly DNS provider. You can run your own Stealth Master, which is what I'm going to cover here in a bit, and um, their slaves will serve your signed zone. It works well. The same thing, and we're in the, what room are we in here? The <laughs> Linode room, yes. There is a real good all-in-one solution for small businesses. Maybe you're not, maybe you don't have any really expert um, Linux or DNS ad administrators on staff, but you can get your own Linode for a reasonably low cost per month, and they're, they wanted me to tell you, now this is not a plug, but okay, it's a plug. They wanted me to tell you that they're offering $50 discounts for anybody who stops by their table and asks for one. But um, I have personal familiarity with them. I'm not a Linode user, but uh, I, I have uh, uh, my zone is slaved on their uh, servers, and it works very well. It, you, when you uh, update a signature or anything in your zone, it prop it propagates instantly to all your slaves and uh, is immediately available to be served. Um, other DNSSEC friendly DNS providers, um, DYN is a good example. Most of the free ones that I know do not support DNSSEC. Even the ones that have been saying for years that they're going to, like uh, <clears throat> um, Hurricane Electric, he.net, they've, they've got a really good uh, DNS service, but not yet supporting DNSSEC. <laughs> good man. <laughs> Things might go better for them if they weren't using Power DNS. <laughs> man after my own heart. 
Oh my, are we up to summary yet? It says summary. DNSSEC signing your own data is a, is a way to protect your reputation, your company. Okay, in the real world, there's not a whole lot of attacks of DNS spoofing going on, but you never know when it's going to happen. It could happen, and there can always be a man in the middle. So, there if are actually a lot of uh, Wi-Fi attacks, you're connecting at Starbucks, you should be worried about that. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Um, if he, he says if you're connecting at a Starbucks or a lot of public uh, um, Wi-Fi access points, you need to be thinking about this. Now, while that's about signing, you're talking about validating, and yet, but yeah, that's a good point. You can get benefit, to get the benefit of DNSSEC is, as we showed, very simple. I showed you the entire namedconf that you need, a single line. Or you can use the, the browser plugin if that's what you're more comfortable with. The good thing about the browser plugin, I will say, is that it's not going to just baffle you with NX domain replies. In other words, the domain does not exist. That's what you're going to, well, you don't get NX domain, you get serve fail when the signature fails. But your browser isn't going to know the difference. It's going to say, I wasn't able to find the address for www.example.org. Now, if you publish DNS data, you should sign it. You've got responsibility to your users and, and, as I said, to your own reputation. For their security and for your own, it's a good idea to do this. This is technology that works. It's not new. It's been well supported for years. It's getting better all the time. As I said, bind 9.8 was good. 9.9 .9 was way better. But um, it's there. It, it, it's there. It's available to use. It just hasn't gotten a lot of um, widespread adoption yet. Okay, I've got a few acknowledgments. Um, I really want to thank my colleague uh, Vicki Risk at uh, ISC, who, while I was rehearsing this presentation on the telephone, um, actually wrote up these slides for me. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I also want to thank my other colleagues at ISC. It's a great company. It's, it's a great place to work. It's a, it's a virtual place to work. I actually uh, work from my home in uh, rural Dixieland where I have a slow DSL signal and um, you know, I manage to get by. But it's nice. My commute to work is not too difficult most times. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, there's, well, no, actually it's in the same room. We'll not go into that. <laughs> hey, I'm a geek. You are too. I know you are, Jeff. <laughs> okay, uh, and at this time I'm going to ask if there's, well, you know what? I probably ought to go into the, uh, you want me to do the questions and comments now or go into the sample uh, signing a zone? Okay, we'll, we'll do the sample signing zone and come back to this. I hit escape and move over to another desktop where I have, that's white? No, oh yeah, I see where I'm at. Okay, there we go. Okay. Oh boy, I made the terminal way too big for this window. wonder if I can... Maybe if I maximize it, it'll do. Hey, good deal. Okay. All right. Uh, the tool that you use to sign or to, to generate your keys, this is what you got one of the steps you have to do to sign your zone, is called, surprisingly enough, DNSSEC hyphen keygen. If you call it by that name, the, the defaults are pretty much going to work. The only thing you have to tell it is, name. It says owner of the key. 
That's a little confusing. It was to me when I first came across that. But what that means is basically the name of the zone you are signing. If you own example.org, then it is DNSSEC hyphen keygen space example.org. That's all that is required. Now, we're going to, I'm going to suggest you would use the dash K, the very first option there, dash K and the directory name to write keys into the, a, uh, a directory because we're going to do the auto DNSSEC maintain later on. We want it to go ahead and put the keys in the key directory. We're going to go page down there. The output, we're going to get at the very bottom there, we're going to get two files. One is the K and the name, which it was example.org in the example. The algorithm, plus algorithm, then plus the ID of the key, which is a five digit number. Um, at least the ones, most of the ones I've seen are. Uh, I'm not sure how they actually figure that, but uh, we don't need to know details. Dot key, that's the, that is the record that's going to have the DNS key records that you're going to put in your zone. Okay. The um, other file is the secret key itself. And it's going to have a similar naming scheme except it's going to be dot .private. That needs to be kept secure in your key directory. It needs to be readable by the user that is running named E, which maybe you're just using root. I don't have anything against using root as bind. Now, okay, we've had a few uh, security issues. I'm not going to deny it, but I'll tell you something about the security issues we have. It's all denial of service stuff. It's that somebody can crash your server. We don't have root exploits. We haven't had those for I don't know how long, but it's not, it's not happening anymore. One thing we do in Linux, this is a Linux fest, so I'll speak Linux specific, is that we use the um, capabilities uh, feature in the kernel. When root starts named E, root binds the, binds, get it, the port 53, which is a privilege port of um, UDP and TCP, and also the port 953 for, um, for um, RNDC. Those are all privileged ports, and that's a privileged action that, that NAMD has to do. That's, I believe, the only privileged action that we do. At that point, NAMD drops all super user privileges, and even though it's still running as the user root, it cannot go read Alan's files or Jeff's files. If the process is compromised, it can only read files that the user root could read if root was not a super user. Does that make sense? You understand? You're not going to have a, a root exploit from named E. If you do, then uh, I'll eat my words. But, I mean, things happen, but uh, I, think, I think you can feel fairly secure with named E these days. Okay. Well, um, you, you're talking about it running as the named user, and uh, that is a, a command line option that you're going to give it. Now, most distros are going to do that by default. I believe that Fedora does that. I believe Debian does that, and, and Debian derived distros. Mm, uh, Slackware doesn't. I, I will tell you that. I know that Slackware does not, and I don't think that Gen 2 does, but I don't know. Right, it's an option. Which, which you can do that in Slackware or, or any other distro. You simply add the uh, dash u command. You waved at me. Am I running out of time? Wait a minute. I can see what time it is. Okay. I'm not running out of time. I'm doing good. All right. Um, oh, there's one other I should cover here is user has been... Um, D -N -D -S, DS from key. 
Okay, this is the second thing you'll have to do. You take your, you'll get your keys from the DNSSEC key gen, and then the uh, DS from key, DNSSEC DS from key command is how you extract your DS record to put in the parent, uh, publish in the parent zone. That's pretty simple too. You're gonna, you might want to pass the dash uppercase K directory to tell it where to find where your keys are. Or if you're in the same directory, it'll just take a relative path and you don't need that. Um, there's other um, options there that you're not likely to need. But, um, but that's what you do. You'll, you'll come, what you will get is a, uh, a DS um, record on standard output. Okay, now I wanted to go over what um, unsigned records look like. I didn't mention that in the slides, but uh, here is a sample unsigned zone that I'm familiar with. And um, these, are, these are the typical records you're going to see in, a, um, in an unsigned zone. Notice there are no RR SIGs, there are no um, um, INSEC records, which is the next secure record. Uh, I want to bring your attention to down there at the bottom, the message size 348, 348 bytes. That's pretty small, and, it, and there's a lot of information that has come in that one little packet. The next example here is a signed zone, Oops. which is isc.org. And look, there we have all those scary looking RR SIG records. We have down there at the bottom now. Okay, up near the top now, we've got our two DNS keys. Um, after DNS, and let me highlight that so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, 257, I'm not, I, I can't remember offhand, I haven't had enough coffee this morning to remember, but one of those is the zone signing key and one is the key signing key, and it, Thank you, sir. 257 is the key signing key. This is what we have published the DS record in the parent zone of .org. Um, 256, the next one there is the zone, I mean the zone signing key, right. And um, that signs all the records in the zone. So that has done all, now these uh, first two are our SIGs. One of them, I think, is from the, uh, obviously one is from the key signing key, but I think there might be, the other one is uh, from the zone signing key. That's an option. Nobody really cares about uh, the zone signing key's opinion of the DNS key RR set, but it doesn't hurt anything either. Okay. That was all that. Okay, now I want to go, I've got a simple, bare minimum for signing a zone. And I finished the namedy.conf. I didn't finish your sample zone file, but you can get a sample zone file anywhere you like. They're, they're not very complicated. The, um, uh, th I've got a slightly larger options block in this one. For This is for the authoritative server that is serving assigned zone. I set the directory there. That's just a convenience. It, it's not required. And then I set the key directory. Now that is required for auto DNS sec maintain. So that has to be there. The last line, DNS sec enable yes, I looked that up and I believe we've had that uh, 
as default in all supported versions and then some. I think it went back to 9.7, which is no longer supported. So you don't need that, but if you have, happen to have DNSSEC enabled no, then, then that would obviously break things. Then we've got the next, the simple little zone uh, stanza, example.org in class in, the internet class, which is pretty much all DNS these days. Um, you need to declare it as a type of master. We give it a file name and you can name it whatever you like. A lot of uh, distros use a default of a .db or, or db dot on the front of it sometimes. Those don't matter. It's all up to you. Whatever makes sense to the administrator is all it needs. We are using inline signing, yes, and auto DNSSEC maintain. In your zone file, which I did not finish typing before running in here, uh, all you're going to have to do is paste in those uh, DNS key records that you got from DNSSEC key gen. Just paste them right in there and it will and along with the other records you have, a zone requires at minimum an SOA, start of authority record. It requires at least one NS record. What else does a zone require? Anybody know? Good. That's right. It does not require anything else. Just those two. You don't have to have any A records. You do not have to have any other type of records. Most people are going to want to have an A record or, or a quad A for the um, IPv6 folks. But um, those are not required to um, run your, uh, or to serve your zone. Um, after you have done this, you save that. You, do, you, you can restart your NAMD process or, re, or do a reconfig, RNDC reconfig. And suddenly, you are serving signed data. Inline signing means we can edit that zone file, which I call var.named, var slant named slant example.org. We can edit that just like we've always done years past, and um, which people like Alan, I know they like to do that. He edited my zone file one time, which wasn't supposed to be done. All in the past, bud. Don't worry. <laughs> um, you can still do that with inline signing. That was a popular feature of, of Bind 9.9. .9. So um, now the, the modern way, the way I like to do it, and, and the way we're recommending to most um, customers, and a lot of them say, no, they don't want to do it that way, is to use the uh, NS update program, which uh, basically you're going to change your zone data by means of a special DNS query that goes to your master server and it will edit the zone contents in memory and it'll send it out to the slaves and record it in all the uh, journal files on the master and the slaves instantly. Um, NS update is a more flexible way to handle uh, zone data management in the future, but a lot of people are not there yet. But if we can get them signing zones, we'll be happy. Okay. At that point, I think I'm going to go back to the questions and comments, and we're going to be done in plenty of time. How about that? Oops, wrong place. Let's do this. And, okay, whoa, wrong place there. Oh, I don't know how to work this thing. Okay, anybody have any questions or any comments? Go ahead, sir. Um, the question is, 
about distributing uh, SSH keys and other secure type of um, information via uh, DNS. And uh, are you familiar with the, um, what do they call that? Uh, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I've just published it in my own zone. But uh, we're doing that with email now. That's already working for email. It's called, uh, somebody help me out. No, sir? No, we're talking about um, where you, you publish your SSL key for your, for your name, for your mail server in Dane. Dane, Dane, which stands for DNS Authentication of Named Entities. Dane is there. I don't know if it's working for SSH uh, keys yet, but there's no reason why it couldn't. Uh, okay. I'm going to have a hard time repeating all that back for the record, but uh, basically he's saying that OpenSS H already supports uh, option, alternate means of doing that. But do check out Dane, and that is another real advantage of, uh, of DNSSEC is that you can have guaranteed secure email. Um, you know that you're not going to have any snooping in the middle if you have verified the other side's key, and you can do that if they have signed and published their Dane records, which I have done, on, and I don't believe we've done it at isc.org yet, but I've been nagging about that. Alan, go ahead. Go ahead. Chain of trust, right. Right. What well, the, the what prevents someone from spoofing the root TLDs? Well, guess what? We have built into every copy of NameD. We have the root key. Yeah, but that doesn't help people who aren't using NameD if they're all using the root key. Get a copy of the root key. The, right. From ISP or like three other different sources. Uh, Inter NIC, uh, IANA. IANA is the uh, .org is the authoritative source of the root uh, public key, and uh, there's lots of different places you can get it and verify it. Um, if you trust ISC, you just use your name D, and uh, if you're not running name D, then uh, I guess that's not my problem, is it? <laughs> but yeah, there's other implementations are going to have other ways of of entering the key and, and verifying records from there. Okay, somebody over here, we'll go ahead. Is there any uh, type of revocation in the system? Any type of revocation in the system. You simply change your DS record at the uh, parent and then um, that will uh, invalidate the older key. Now, uh, let's talk about key rollover. I think that's a useful uh, thing we, we should touch on because, um, well, there's a reason why they decided on the, the zone signing key and the key signing key model. The reason being a single signature does not pre present a whole lot of, uh, of attacker, uh, cryptographic attack uh, profile. You're not going to be able to do, um, get a whole lot of, uh, well, I, I'm no cryptographic expert. I, it, maybe somebody in here is, but uh, basically it's not going to be easy to attack from the, uh, uh, just looking at the, the key signing key. Now the zone signing key has considerable more uh, exposure because it's signed every record in your zone. And you might occasionally want to uh, roll over your zone signing key. Um, as for rolling over the key signing key, 
most zones really don't need to worry about that very often, maybe 10 years. And that's, um, I mean, your own paranoia level is going to determine that. But basically, we don't have any reason to think that you're going to need to roll over your key signing key very often at all. Uh, rolling over your zone signing key, really the only reason I would say to do that every two or three years is just so you can remember how to do it. <laughs> I always forget these <laughs> things. I'm serious. You know, you're gonna, if you don't know how to do the rollover, you're going to forget it. And we've got knowledge base articles at kb.isc.org that cover um, DNSSEC and key rollovers. Plus there's um, uh, some good presentations of, uh, uh, on DNSSEC from uh, a colleague of mine, Alan Clegg, has done, um, I believe he called it DNSSEC in six minutes. I think it took a little longer than six minutes. I, should, I know mine did. But, um, but I, would, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to look up that. I believe we've got the video. I don't know if we have video online, but we have the slides and the audio. Um, did that address what you were asking? Okay. Anyone else? Jeff. Um, older mechanism before inline signing. What you had to do if you wanted to just edit your zone file and uh, as you've always done you had to have you had to manually sign it you'd have to uh, keep your your plain text zone and your signed zone and you would add your records sign it with um, I can't even remember the name of the tool DNS <laughs> sign zone yeah or RNDC sign is another way to do it uh, live. But uh, you'd have to manually take the steps to sign it before inline signing. Anyone else? I think lunch sounds pretty good about now. What are you? Seconded. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you much. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.